Good evening, good evening, Henrico family. It is six o'clock, so we are going to get started with our listening town hall. First, I'd love to say welcome to you for joining us for the listening town hall this evening with school board members Christy Kinsella from the Brooklyn District and Marcy Shea from the Tuckahoe District. I am Adrian Cole Johnson, Director of Family and Community Engagement, and will serve as this evening's facilitator. So before we hear from our school board members and then from you, I'd like to start with just some quick housekeeping details. So this evening's li listening session is being recorded and is also being live streamed on the HCPS homepage at HenricoSchools.us. To speak, please raise your hand using the raise your hand icon or simply type your name and school affiliation in the chat box. We will do our best to call on speakers in order, and speakers will be announced in groups of three. We're also asking that you mute your microphone, if you could do that now, and just wait until it's your turn to speak so that we can hear everyone. everyone. Please state your name and school affiliation when speaking, if you choose, before speaking. So to allow time for as many speakers as possible, we're asking that you keep your comments to approximately 90 seconds or less. And again, as a reminder, this is an informal opportunity to provide input regarding the reopening of school prior to the school board vote this Thursday, October 22nd. Now, since this is a listening session, written comments should be submitted on the public comment form, not typed in the meeting chat and that will be circulated throughout the chat feature throughout the evening. So feel free to drop any written feedback there. Board members Christy Kinsella and Marcy Shea are here to listen on behalf of, of the school board. So let's have them to get us started with brief remarks. So I'll go in alphabetical order and start with Mrs. Kinsella from the Brooklyn District for her remarks. So, Christy Kinsella, if you're out there, would you like to kick us off with remarks for the evening? Sorry, the famous onion. It got me. It always happens. Good, good evening. Um, like Ms. Cole Johnson said, I'm Christy Kinsella of the Brooklyn District, and I'd just like to thank Ms. Cole Johnson for facilitating this virtual event uh, tonight. On behalf of your Henrico School Board, welcome. Um, Roscoe Cooper of the Fairfield District, Mickey Ogburn representing the Three Chop District, and Miss Alicia Atkins representing the Verina District couldn't join us this evening virtually. Uh, many have asked why tonight's meeting is virtual and not in person. And the reason is simple. It's because we wanted to allow more people um, flexibility uh, for folks who can't join us perhaps on Thursday. And in, in addition, we can accommodate more speakers virtually than we could in person as to social distancing guidelines. Um, because your board members value you and your feedback, Mrs. Shea and I are representing the board tonight. And as Mrs. Cole Johnson stated earlier, this event is being recorded so that our board colleagues will be able to listen to the feedback prior to Thursday's meeting. Ms. Shea. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella, um, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we are here to listen to your comments and feedback relating to um, the decision on Thursday. Um, like Ms. Cancello said, we wanted to make sure that um, you all, our constituents, had every possible opportunity to share feedback and be, he and be heard before Thursday's decision. Um, just a reminder, um, no new information will be covered this evening. Um, and we won't be um, answering any questions. Um, a lot of the questions you have are um, questions that Ms. Kinsella and I ourselves are still um, working on finding answers for this week um, leading up to Thursday's decision. Um, as it's already been said, um, for those who want to listen um, and not necessarily participate as a speaker, there's a live stream of this evening's session that's available at HenricoSchools.us. Other opportunities to provide input can be found on the HCPS school board page, which includes 
a written public comment form in which those public comments will become part of public record in board docs, as well as you can sign up to speak at the October 22nd public forum, which is between 5 to 7 at Newbridge Auditorium. Um, um, on behalf of Ms. Kinsella and I, and really the whole school board, not only do we thank our constituents for joining us, but um, we truly want to thank the staff that has put this on. Um, not only Adrian Cole Johnson, who's our moderator, but also our communications team, Sean Gilliland, um, Courtney Bytop, uh, Chris O'Brien, Kevin Dykes, and Jeff Quinlan. It takes a lot of people behind the scenes to manage all the questions and shuffle everything around for what is um, quickly approaching 300 people in the town hall. So a big thanks to our staff and I'll stop talking so we can hear from you because that's what tonight's really about. Awesome. You, thank you both um, for your remarks and I don't think I can echo any more the fact that it really, you all really are the experts this evening and our board members are really here to, to listen from you. Um, so again, I'll ask if everyone can take a moment just to mute their phone so we can hear the remarks and comments before we jump in. And we have um, the list is started. So our first three speakers are Sally Burgess, Morgan Walls and Julie Atlas. And so Sally, if you're there, we will start with you. If you can unmute your mic. Yeah, good Good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to request the detailed results of the functional performance testing that was conducted for each air handling unit, as well as all corrective actions taken on HVAC units at every school. Um, in short, we would like a report card on um, the HVAC units for every school as was requested by Reverend Cooper. Um, and the question I have is, will teachers, staff, and students be required to occupy rooms in which HVAC is inoperable? Will teachers and students be moved if that is the case? Thank you. Okay, I was just taking a moment to try to mute to mute us all. Hopefully that's a bit better. Thank you so much for your comment, Sally. Next we have Morgan Walls. If you will unmute yourself. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Morgan Walls and I'm an ESL teacher at Brooklyn Middle School. Um, I am very concerned about the nursing shortage that I've heard um, exists. I spoke to health services today and they said, that there is currently not a nurse assigned to every single school and that they're still in the process of hiring nurses. Um, and there's also going to be nurse aid positions, but those have not been filled. Um, so I don't really understand how we can go back if we don't have nurses to take care of the students. Um, I was also informed that in the event that a nurse cannot be in the COVID-19 isolation room, that two staff members will be assigned to cover that room as a duty. Um, and I just want to reiterate that we are not medical professionals, the teachers and staff of schools, and I don't think it's appropriate for schools to reopen without the proper medical personnel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, next, we have Julie Atlas. Hi, my name is Julie Atlas. I'm a math coach at Highland Springs Elementary School. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to virtually speak within the safety of my home. I'd ask that in the future there be a virtual option added to the live school board meeting to also provide for this. I've been a teacher for over 15 years. My experience tells me that children and adults follow the rules some of the time. The size of the classrooms does not accommodate social distancing. I've seen classrooms where there's not even enough room to walk sideways between desks. I have seen classes that have had two or three groups of extra children added into them because of the lack of substitute teachers. Many classrooms do not have hot water or even faucets that stay on without being held. At my school, students must go through two heavy doors to go between the toilet and the sink. Teachers are being told that children will remain in their classes all day long, even for meals. So now I come to some other important facts. The number of employees in our county is approximately 6,600. If only 7% of our employees contract COVID, around 462 will become sick. 
if four and a half percent of them die, there will be 21 deaths. So my question to the board is, who are you going to choose to die? I have a master's degree focused on trauma. I know that when someone dies, it will increase trauma for both our students and our staff. It will create holes in staffing that will grow and it will force employees to make very difficult decisions. So I ask you not to force us to make a choice between our lives, our families lives and our careers. Keep us home until it's safe and there's a vaccine. You already ask us to stand between our students and a bullet. You ask us to protect them in a hurricane, a tornado, a fire, from domestic violence and from all harm. You as a board cannot control these things, but you can control this situation. Don't force us to play Russian roulette with our lives or lose our careers. Don't make us return until it's safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and, and just thank you all for your comments. As you know, our school board members are very intently listening to everything that you share. I wanted to address a few comments, um, a few mentions in the comments. If you are on your phone and if you can't locate the raise your hand feature, it should just be a hand, but if you don't see it, feel free to type your name in the chat and you may say, I'd like to speak and just put your name there. You'd still be added to the list. Also, if you have written comments, please drop them in the link that's shared. Um, the public comment form to make sure that it's recorded. If it's placed in the chat, you risk the chance of that not happening. And so just wanting to make sure that we are able to, um, you know, really record your, your written comments. All right. So our next group consists of Maria Kirtley, Carolyn Broshnian, and Elizabeth Goldberg. So Maria Kirtley, if you will unmute yourself and share your comment. So much. I appreciate the time. Um, I just want to let you as school board members and parents know that are listening that educators have been asked since March to build a plane while it's in mid flight. And this is a term that my fellow coworkers have heard on more than one occasion. And while that might have been something that was appropriate in March, we're now reaching November and we're being asked um, after several months of being given an opportunity to plan something to go into something potentially in three weeks that educators or have no idea what the true logistics, neither do parents. And I say that out of concern as a parent and an educator. Um, I am a collaborative teacher, ESL, with um, special education. I do not know of any logistics of doing collaborative teaching at this time. Uh, we are not aware of how transportation will be working, lunch breaks, uh, bathroom breaks, um, the three feet distancing, how that's going to be impacting. And there's just a lot of concerns of how these logistics are going to work. More importantly, it seems like the only way to make this work if we have students in the building and virtually is to ask students in our building to continue doing predominantly virtual. And I have to ask myself, what is the value of putting all of these people at a higher risk of exposure if they're going to be doing something, including my daughter, my child, uh, that she could be doing at home in a less restrictive environment and avoid so many people from being put at a higher risk of exposure. So thank you for your time. And I truly hope that you consider keeping us virtually for the second nine weeks until we have time to responsibly look at this plan that the, the superintendent and school board will be willing to offer, that we can responsibly look at it as parents and as teachers and vet it for error that we none of us want to have happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Maria. Next, we have Carolyn Brashnian. Hi, sorry about that. It took me a second to get off mute. Um, my name is Carolyn Brosnahan. I am a parent of three children at Cackley Elementary School. Um, I fully understand the want, need and desire to get children back into the classroom. I, as a parent, have a kid who is struggling with that, with virtual education, right? It is difficult for everybody. I understand that. I have some major concerns though with the speed with which the county is pushing for this option to occur. To have a questionnaire come out, um, get the results and then make a vote and plan to implement whatever plan it is that goes into place within three weeks to me seems too fast and it too much of a risk for our students and for our teachers for that matter. My son is that's struggling is asthmatic. 
he's struggling so much with school that we're actually considering sending him if there were some sort of hybrid option. But I don't feel comfortable right now with the county's ability to plan and execute properly any kind of safety measures or protective measures for the teachers or the students at this time. So I'd really like to see the county take the information that they've received for this questionnaire, implement an intent form, but not plan to actually implement anything in person until January when they've had the time to fully plan out what things will look like, how many kids are going to be in each classroom, what is the distancing between desks, um, I mean, many other things, and I've put co written comments in, uh, I believe Ms. Shea actually responded to me to an email I had, just a question on the questionnaire itself, but I'd just like to really stress that it's going too quickly with not enough planning and, and time for implementation. And thank you so much for the time and comments. Thank you, Carolyn. Next up, we have Elizabeth Goldberg. But Elizabeth, before you start, I'll ask individuals, if you drop your name in the chat, um, if you say that you want to make a comment, type in your name beside that statement too for us as well. So Elizabeth Goldberg, if you can unmute your mic. Good evening, my name is Elizabeth Goldberg and I work at Verina High School. I wanted to speak tonight because I, like so many of my colleagues, am feeling panicked and helpless about the possibility of returning to in-person learning. As I speak, corona cases of coronavirus are surging across the area and as we approach fall and winter, it is scientifically agreed upon that those numbers will continue to rise. As a school counselor in a small office, I am overwhelmingly afraid of the hazard I may face simply by fulfilling the expectations of my job. There is no way we will, we will be able to consistently enforce social distancing, mask wearing, and testing at the high school level. And unfortunately, the only people who think otherwise are those who don't work in a school setting. My job is especially difficult in this position because my role in the school building is to be uniquely available to students without threat of discipline or judgment. Should students come to my office without a mask or are so upset that wearing one properly is impossible, I have to step outside of my role to enforce a rule to keep us safe rather than be focused on providing comfort or restoring calm to the student. Not to mention that in school counseling, we would be exposed to students not able to keep their physical expressions of emotion under control. There are runny noses, teary eyes, and labored breathing that would make managing risk untenable and would put us at higher risk. We've already had three cases of COVID at my school without students present and minimum staff on campus. So I think it's fair to extrapolate what will happen if staff and students return, especially with the increased exposure resulting from Thanksgiving. I, for one, will not be able to see my mother if we return in person because she's in a high risk category and the possibility of transmission is too high. I was extremely disappointed in the staff survey because it was apparent that our feelings and opinions were not being considered and asking educators to choose between their work and the safety of their family only furthers feelings of mistrust and anxiety. Last night's removal of staff survey feedback from the HCPS website was even more wounding than the survey itself. And I ask you to reflect on the implications of making too rash a, deci a decision to solve some student issues only to put in danger the very people you are depending on to help our school communities. The fact that you've recently posted 78 positions for classroom monitors beginning November 16th begs the question whether this forum is just a charade, but I hope logic and desire to stand in solidarity with staff prevails. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Our next three are Eleanor Gillian, Melissa Weaver, and Allison Kasher. So Eleanor, if you're out there, if you will unmute your mic and share your comment. Hi, good evening. I'm Eleanor Guillen. I teach Spanish at Hermitage High School. And um, I wanted to address this not from strictly a health concern standpoint, but just logistics. The plans that we have heard so far are that teachers will be teaching virtual and in-person students, um, which virtual takes all of our day. I'm used to technology. We had school space already when I was in school. I used Blackboard in college. I learned Schoology easily when I started teaching. And even for me, who I'm relatively technology savvy, it takes me for every hour of class time, it's two to three hours of prep outside the classroom. And you're asking us, we're, what we're hearing is that the plan is going to be virtual and in person and asking us to do both is asking us to accomplish neither. Um, I will be able to give students even less attention than I can give them now when I can't pull students aside for one-on-one -on -one, and I can't interact individually with students very much except for Schoology messages or asking them to hop on the meeting outside of school. If we're being asked to, you know, the logistics of social distancing in the restroom and cafeteria are things that we've been discussing at our faculty meetings. 
prep preparing for this. And if we're being asked to do all of that, I will not be able to interact with my students, essentially. We, we have no time. We are being asked to do too much. And I would beg the school board to take another nine weeks, really consider a plan that will work, work on the logistics, make a more solid you know, action plan, and then revisit in the next semester. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Next, we have Melissa Weaver. Sarah, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak this evening. I've also sent a, um, my thoughts to the board for the um, meeting that you're going to have later this week. So um, first of all, thank you to all of you for everything that you're doing. I, I cannot imagine how difficult this time must be being in the school systems as a board member or as a teacher or an administrative staff. Um, I am a mother of a high school student I'm, um, and was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 37. Since that time, I have um, lung and heart pre-existing conditions that um, make me extremely susceptible to the negative impacts of COVID. But that isn't really what my main concern is. I mean, that is, of course, a big concern. My main concern is um, the learning environment if we do open. I, I was a little disappointed to hear that some positions have already been posted. I think that makes me a little fearful of what direction we're headed in. So I do hope that our thoughts and comments are being taken seriously. I, I would love to think they would. I have the highest respect for what you do. So um, as a parent and as a mental health clinician, um, I echo what was said earlier about grief and trauma. And I, I think that has to be taken into consideration. Losing a parent or another family member or the child themselves at a young age would be disruptive to the overall well-being of children. Um, and also being in an environment that is more restrictive. I do agree with that piece about the mask. I do agree that, um, that if teachers are presented with the responsibility of protecting children and their families, it makes it extremely difficult to be able to effectively teach within the classroom setting. So those are my main concerns. My only other concern um, is is the impact the overall impacts of the stress of the child themselves when they're attending school i do totally respect and understand the need for social connections but i believe there are other ways to have social connections and i think we've all learned how to do this so i think there are opportunities for growth here and i think when we look back we want to say that we did all that we could versus we made the mistake in in going back too soon so I do urge you to consider that in making your decision. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Next, we have Allison Kasher. But after Allison, the next group, um, we have Tamika. We don't have your last name, but Tamika, if you signed up early, um, Yale Levine, and then Donna Forrester. But next, we will have Allison. Allison, if you're here. Yes, I'm actually Michael Kasher. I'm on my wife's phone. Okay, uh, that's fine. That's okay. My, my question is, is as myself, I have um, heart issue. I've, I've, I've got heart disease. I'm recovering from a heart attack. And I also suffer from severe asthma, like many people in Richmond, it seems like. But, uh, my question is, 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 you know, my wife's the first responder, so we haven't been together for eight months now. And I have a four-year-old and a, and a, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old that I take care of. And my question is, if they go back to school and say somebody tests positive or if they get exposed, what exactly, how quickly is the protocol so that it doesn't come home to me? As, as the caregiver for my children. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm severely high risk. I haven't been out able to drive for, for six months. And, you know, I, you know, I, I just, we're worried. So we're just wondering what the protocol is for that. Um, if somebody tests positive in the classroom. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your points. Again, I will ask everyone to um, just check their phones, make sure that they're muted um, periodically. 
Um, next up, we have Tamika Williams. Tamika, if you're here. Good evening. Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the parents and grandparents out there. I'm a grandmother and I have a six year old granddaughter that I have to take care of because her mom works from home. So she's not able to do it. So sending her back into the class is um, high risk for me. And she, my daughter also has a one year old. So I'm not sure or I don't understand what the rush is and especially with cold and flu season coming right now to try to send them back into the classroom right now on top of having COVID out here, I think is extremely risky. And I, I really believe that you all should reevaluate that because um, the kids, regardless of if there's, they say that their symptoms aren't as bad as the adults, let's take that into consideration for some, but for some they are getting MIS, which is multi-inflammatory syndrome, which means that we don't know the outcome that these children will have that will last them as they grow into adults with having all of their organs being inflamed with the multi-inflammatory system disorder. We also need to take all of that into consideration. I really think the next nine weeks should not be thought about bringing the kids back into the classroom. And I thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Tamika. Next, we have Yale Levine. Yale, if you're there. Um, hello, my name is Eden and I'm a yes, six and I'm her son and I'm a sixth grader at Hungary Creek. And I used to really like school, but now it's boring and very frustrating to me in the virtual environment. And I feel like I'm spending way too much time on the camera. And so a lot of times it just gives me a lot of headaches and things. And I'd really appreciate it if you gave us a choice to go back in person. Thank you so much for your comment. We appreciate it. OK, next we have Donna Forrester. Donna, if you're out there, you can unmute your mic and share your comments. Hi, I'm Donna Forrester. Um, I'm a middle school life science teacher, and I just had a few things. One of the things is that I've always been extremely proud to be a Henrico educator because we have such technological capabilities. And so um, I wonder in a time when this could really be our greatest strength, why we would not take advantage of having the technology that we have and the support that we have in order to administer our instruction virtually. Um, I know that it, it may not be going perfect for everyone, um, but with my students, it seems to be engaging and, and seems to be working well. I know that when we go back, I, I do wonder if parents realize that just even some of the information I've gotten already about going back to school with, you know, students sitting on extreme ends of rows of desks, you know, three to six feet apart with mask on and they're putting plexiglass in all the classrooms and the teachers are behind plexiglass and we're, we're really having, we can't even, we're told not to even walk around the room. We can't get too close to kids. Um, you know, is it really going to be better with students basically virtual learning inside of a school, not really being able to talk to each other, not really interacting much? Um, I don't think it's going to be school as maybe some people think school is, even when they go back in person. And and the other thing I'm not sure maybe if um, some people realize is what an amazing job Henrico County has done in preparing virtual lessons for teachers. It still takes hours and hours. I've been teaching for 29 years and I feel like a new teacher, so it is hard. I spend a lot of time to really, you know, do a great job with virtual teaching. But Henrico County has even gone to the length of filming labs so that my kids can collect data. And so students are still participating virtually in labs and things like that. So we have great capability to do virtual teaching and I just hope that the board will take that into consideration. Thank you so much, Donna. Our next group of three, Amy Anderson, Jennifer Seymour, and Deborah Parker. So we'll start with Amy Anderson. Again, Amy Anderson, if you're here and would still like to leave a comment, you are welcome to do so now. Okay, 
Well, we will keep moving on. Next, we have Jennifer Seymour. Jennifer Seymour, if you're there and would still like to leave a comment. Okay. We will move right along. Next, Deborah Parker, are you out there? Would you like to still leave a comment? Good evening, everyone. My name is Deborah Parker. I'm a teacher over at um, Highland Springs Elementary School. And I just want to leave a comment in regards to the fact that we don't know if going back, if children will die. I unfortunately have had the unfortunate experience of burying a child. It is the absolute worst thing a family ever has to go through. It is the saddest thing a family has, ever has to go through. If you have never been to a child funeral, you should count yourself blessed. There is not a day goes by that I do not think of my son. There is not a day that goes by that I don't think about what he would be doing right now. No mother, no family should have to experience what I have over something that is containable, such as keeping our students and our families safe. By keeping us at home, we stay safe. Yes, people want us to go back for the socialization, but as has been said before, school when we go back will not look like school was in February or in January. School will be completely different. Why upend everyone's life to just put us back in the classroom where potentially a child or a teacher may die? Thank you so much for listening. Deborah, thank you so much for your comments. Our next group of three, and I will remind individuals, if you'd like to leave a comment, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we're adding your name to a list, or you can just leave your name and just share in the comments that you would like to, um, that you would like to, that you would like to speak. Our next group of three is James Lincoln, Jamie Tanello, and Betsy Reed. We'll start with James Lincoln. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, if anybody's taking screenshots tonight, please make me look good. I was a little disappointed with what happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I need to shave again. But but in all seriousness, thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Thank you, Ms. Shea, for, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Cole and the whole rest of Henrico County Central Office staff. You guys, not only tonight, but you've been working long hours probably since March, to be honest. Um, and we, although at times maybe disagree with some of some of the recommendations coming out of central office, I want you to know that the parents and teachers in this community really respect y'all's hard work and, and it doesn't go unnoticed. Um, I'm not gonna try and speak too long. Y'all can hear the, uh, the final draft of what I'm gonna say on Thursday. I'm a high school teacher, I work at Verina. I have a middle school student who goes to QMS I have an elementary age son who goes to Jackson Davis Elementary. So I think like a lot of teachers on this call, I'm able to look at this issue from a lot of different angles, from the parent angle and from the teacher angle. And the first thing I wanna to say to parents whose students are struggling in a virtual world, my heart goes out to you and all the educators on this call, I guarantee you aren't happy to hear that. No one is excited about virtual learning. However, and this is even for the young man who spoke so eloquently about how frustrating it is to sit in front of a, a screen all day. However, we need to address this logically as a community. The school board needs to address this logically from a risk reward standpoint, from a cost benefit analysis. And to rush us back into the classroom in the second nine weeks, we will have gained very, very little. We won't have better pedagogy or instruction. As many of my colleagues have accurately and correctly pointed out, instruction in the midst of a socially distanced environment, in the midst of a global pandemic is going to be virtual, just virtual within a school building. So I'm sorry to tell that young man who spoke that he's still going to be sitting in front of a screen all day. 
So we're not going to gain anything instructionally by going back. Socially and emotionally, as my colleague Ms. Goldberg so eloquently pointed out, her job as a counselor is going to be severely restricted, not to mention our students, whether it's social distance restrictions, mass restrictions, or simple travel restrictions, are going to be in a more oppressive environment in the school than they are now currently at home for the majority of them. So we gain nothing instructionally, we gain nothing socially and emotionally, and I haven't even gotten to the community health aspect. As the numbers are trending in a direction that make none of us happy, as the numbers are trending in a direction that tell all of us that our situation right now is as dire as it was in July, if not as it was in March, the idea to bring people back into enclosed spaces where social distancing is impossible, where groups of 10 or less are impossible, is ludicrous. So once again, I'm asking everybody on this call, if we rush back second nine weeks, what are we gaining? We're not gaining anything from a community health standpoint. We're not going to gain anything from a social emotional standpoint, not to mention the anxiety that we're going to put on the shoulders of our teachers and their families. And we're not going to gain anything instructionally. We're simply going to be doing virtual in a more oppressive environment, whereas my colleagues have pointed out, because they're now juggling virtual and face-to-face -face learning, kids are actually going to get far less attention than they deserve. So once again, I respect those people who are rushing to get back, and I thank you for pointing out my 90-second limit. I wish this was the Oscars. Y'all could play some music. I'm wrapping it up. But I need y'all to understand that these teachers and these parents on this call are not messing around. We're not doing this out of selfish reasons. My youngest son is not in love with virtual learning. But I can tell you, as someone who tries to look at all of this logically, if we're not going to if we're not going to gain anything instructionally, if we're not going to gain anything socially, emotionally, and if we're not going to gain anything community health wise, then I want to ask all of you. Why the risk? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, James. I'm going to again ask everyone to mute their phones if they're not speaking. Can you? All right. I love hearing the voices, though. Um, so next we have Jamie Tonello. And after Jamie, we'll have Betsy Reed. Jamie? Hi, I'm Jamie Tanell. I'm a third grade teacher at Holiday Elementary. I have four children. I have a first grader at Holiday, a fourth grader at Holiday, a middle schooler at Brooklyn Middle School, a um, high schooler at Highland Springs High School in the engineering program, and my husband is an instructional aide at Wilder. So my biggest concern is that if we return to the building that our kids are not going to be getting an education five days a week like they are right now. We're going to be spending a lot of our time trying to keep the children socially distant or in their little box while we're trying to teach, while they're trying to learn. And unfortunately, I feel like even if we're in the classroom that we will still be using the computer quite a bit because the students are not going to be able to move around like in regular school before COVID hit. Um, so I strongly urge you and the board for us not to return in person right now because it's not safe for all learners. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, before Betsy unmutes, the next group consists of Suzanne Heller, Jeff B, and Kevin Eddins. Betsy Reed, if you're still here, if you'd like to share your comment. Yeah, thank you for the time. And just to jump off of what you said before, I mean, some kids, they want to be in the box in their school. Um, I just ask that you consider choice. Give us the option of a hybrid model for the next nine weeks. Hanover's doing it, Chesterfield's doing it, Powhatan's doing it, Goochland is doing it. Chesapeake, a huge system, is slated to do it next month. We've got to go back. It can be done, and it's being done all over the state. Kids should have the choice to be around other kids, however limited. They need to have the choice to play sports. They need to have the choice to be in clubs. They need to have a choice to learn in a classroom and not at home. You know, it used to be that schools and teachers were concerned for kids' mental health. Where is that concern now? There are kids who want to be in school. Parents want their kids in school. Some of them do. And some teachers want to be in school. So give them that choice. I just ask that you consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. 
Next, we have Suzanne Heller. Suzanne, if you're there. Yes, hi, I'm here. Um, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to come after Betsy because I also am just begging for a choice for these children. Um, we're not forcing people that want to continue learning from home to, you know, go back into the classroom. We're asking everybody, we're just asking for a choice. Um, I'm a physician assistant for the past 13 years, and I base everything off medical research. Um, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, all say the benefits of going back to school is outweighs the risks of staying home. Um, I personally have three children, kindergarten, second, and fourth grade. Uh, we uh, were so disappointed with Henrico County this year that we did choose to enroll them in uh, uh, private school. They wear a mask all day. They sit three feet away from their uh, uh, students. There's 20 kids per class. Nobody is moving from their desk. They wear a mask all day. They have never complained about the mask. Um, to ask a kindergartner to learn virtually, to ask a second grader with dyslexia, to ask a fourth grader with anxiety to stay home and work from a computer is um, nothing short of horrible um, for these children. Um, I found it interesting. Somebody said something about 21 student deaths if we let people go back. So far, there's been one pediatric death in Virginia since March, including when we were at a 20% positivity rate. Now, Virginia is at less than 5%. Um, Let's just give our kids a little bit more credit that they can handle being at a classroom and, um, you know, keep their mask on. I see people are saying, you know, 34 kids in a class. At the same time, though, 50% of people have chosen that they don't want to come back. So if that's 32 kids or 34 kids, 50% of that is 16 or 17. Um, I also think it's interesting. Um, I'd like to see how many um, deaths there have been from suicide or drug overdose from children that are home and living uh, alone. Um, also, I found it interesting that the teacher who first spoke um, was the teacher that was saying we should skew the data for the students and the teachers going back. So I, I just think all that we are asking for is a choice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Next, we have Jeff B. Hi, thank you. Good evening. And uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to have the voices heard of the greater Henrico community. Um, I Kind of wanted to start and just uh, mention a few uh, facts um, that uh, obviously are are free for people to be reviewing uh, both on the CDC site as well as the uh, Virginia um, health site. Um, Virginia just finished uh, as of the end of last week its third highest seven-day moving average for new COVID cases in the state. Um, one of our bordering uh, states, North Carolina, just reported its highest COVID count since the pandemic started. Um, I know folks in the uh, in the area and the community. Uh, I, I would urge people, especially the school board, since this is what we're kind of focusing on here this evening, that the school board would take into consideration the fact that our two largest holidays that are upcoming in November, December, are fast approaching, and I think we'd all and especially the school board uh, would be a little foolish to believe that COVID cases won't spike after folks are wanting to get back together. Um, and I was gonna make a comment about the fact that this town hall is virtual. And I think um, you were the one who mentioned actually that uh, due to the need to have uh, more people present for this, uh, I was gonna mention you know, the fact that we're having this virtually speaks volumes to why that we're not in school, why the kids are not in school. Um, but I think the fact that we do have still so socially distanced guidelines, I think speaks more volumes to the fact that it's not safe for our kids to be back in school. Um, I think uh, for the last uh, person who just spoke about uh, having the kids giving the ability uh, that that kids can uh, can do what's right and stay socially distanced. Uh, I hate to break it to everybody, but adults can't get this right. And we expect kids to get this right. Um, look at uh, professional athletes who have been given these guidelines on staying uh, away, not having guests, and, and they've been infected. Uh, so I think it's a little, uh, a little misguided and, and uh, inappropriate to put that burden on our kids to make the right choices uh, when, of course, when they're together, they're going to want to play and touch and do the things that we want our kids to be doing. Um, and then lastly, I think I'll just uh, I'll end my time here uh, with uh, just a comment about um, you know, why I really don't feel like this county is ready uh, to be sending our kids back to school. 
Uh, just like that one left lane hugging driver in rush hour traffic is bound to snarl traffic, one single outbreak is going to ruin all the work that we've put forth since March to keep our kids safe and out of school. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jeff. Next, we have Kevin, but before Kevin um, shares his comments, our next group consists of Amy Kenyon, Jesse Sanborn, and T. Pitts. Kevin, if you're there, if you can unmute your mic and share your comments. Um, this is this is Kevin's wife, Sarah. He's He is with me. I don't know if you can see him. Um, but I would just like to continue to advocate for the choice to send our children, our family's children, um, back to school in person. I believe that first and foremost, students need to be the primary driver in this decision. What is best for them and their education? Certainly, we absolutely want to keep everyone safe. But, but what is best for students is and their learning is what I believe should be the number one driver. Um, my kids have, I've got a kindergartner, I've got a second grader, and I have a fourth grader all at Tuckahoe Elementary School. And we are huge fans of Tuckahoe. And quite frankly, if it wasn't for their amazing teachers, we probably would have pulled them out by now. Um, but we're hanging on because we believe our school and our teachers are amazing. And, and we believe that they want to get back to school in person as well. Um, but I firmly believe we should not ask our children to do this for nine more weeks. My kindergartner, even with the abbreviated day, um, his his age, it's just a challenge. And um, despite the amazing teachers trying to break up the day and movement breaks, um, my second grader and um, my fourth grader, well, really all of them have had technological issues where they get bounced out of meetings, they come back, they have to get caught up. It's just a huge challenge. Um, my fourth grader has to advocate for herself in front of her whole um, class rather than being able to, to speak one on one with her teacher. Um, so I just believe that uh, that our kids shouldn't be asked to do this for nine more weeks. And um, I know that there's going to be obstacles to in person. Absolutely, there will be. It's going to be a huge adjustment. Um, but I believe that we we ask our kids to do hard things all the time. We've asked them to do a hard thing and learn virtually for nine weeks. And I believe that parents, teachers, administrators, we can all continue um, to do hard things and, and make something work for our students to be in person. Um, anytime there's an obstacle, I don't think it means we just stay home and stay virtual. I think we should get together, collaborate, let our principals, our staff, administration, um, problem solve and and make it happen so that we have a choice to go back in person. I am never advocated for um, for parents to be forced to send their kids back. I just want the choice to send mine back. So I'm going to add one little thing as a high school teacher. I will just say this. Um, this year has been especially challenging for my lower level kids and they're really struggling. I've got more F's this year than I've ever had in my 15 years at my high school. So I will just say this to the school board members that some kids are really grasping virtual, but some kids are not. And some parents are very upset about this and they have no voice in this because they're single parents. And I've talked to those single parents before trying to talk to them about their kids' grades. And so I would just pull that out there as, as a high school teacher in the county. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you for your time. We yeah. appreciate all your hard work. Yeah. Thank you both for your comments. Um, before we go to our next speaker, I just want to remind us, um, if you'd like to sign up, raise your hand or drop your name in the statement that you'd like to make a comment in the chat. I know that um, the chat has been very active and we appreciate the engagement. I would like to remind us to be courteous and respectful to each other. This is a listening session for our school board members, and we want to make sure we can get through as many comments as possible and make sure that our school board members have as much insight as possible from you all throughout the evening. Um, next, we have Amy Kenyon. Amy Kenyon, if you're there and would like to leave a comment or share a comment. Uh, hi, I'm Amy Kenyon. I have uh, spoke at the last school board meeting and I am a former Henrico County School parent um, of a sixth grader, and we made the decision to pull him out of Henrico County Schools uh, this summer when it looked like we were leaning towards virtual learning. 
Kentucky just now is finishing up his ninth week of school and private school. Everything has gone great. Um, they're distancing, they're wearing masks, but they're still having their PE. They're doing school. I am still a huge advocate. I would like to return to Henrico County Schools one day. Um, so based on what I've seen from the surveys, 70% of teachers are willing to go back. Half the kids want to not go back. I don't see why there's any reason in the world why there can't be a match and get some of these kids back. My child is in school with 17 children in his class, plus an additional three that are virtual learners that will return at some point. So um, I'm also the admin of a Facebook page, um, a Henrico County Schools back to school Facebook page with a lot of parents that are kind of intimidated to speak as well. So I want to speak for them. We just want choice. We just want the choice to send our kids back. Um, we want the teachers to have a choice. We want it all to be done safely. Nobody wants any, anything. These teachers, some of them have an impression that we want bad things to happen. We love our kids more than we love anything. And so we're not going to send our kids into a situation that is obviously dangerous. So I just wanted to speak on behalf of my group and uh, hope that the county makes the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And along those lines, I saw someone left a comment also. If the staff is out there, if you can drop in the comment box the public comment form. So if you don't want to speak or if you're not comfortable, you can write your comments out. If we can drop that in the chat, that would be helpful. Next, we have Jesse Sanborn. Hi, I am a second grade teacher at Shady Grove Elementary, and I have four children who are students in Henrico County, and I really was not planning to talk tonight, so I don't have anything prepared. But as I was listening, I felt like as a teacher and as a parent, I needed to say something. I've heard from a lot of people, teachers who are concerned about going back to school. I am in favor of returning to school. I will go if you will let me. I will have my students go if you will let them. I fully respect people who have health concerns and other concerns who do not want to go back. And I think the county is offering that choice. As a person who does want to go back and wants my children to have that experience, I would just ask for the same choice. I think that many, many, many of our surrounding counties are doing it. I have nieces and nephews who are in Hanover and are having a lovely time and it is going as smoothly as can be. My, I have a fourth grade son who is at Deep Run in one of the YMCA success centers. He wears his mask every day, he goes to school, he does his learning and it's gone fine. It's beautiful. He loves the social interaction. He keeps his mask on all day. I don't think it's a problem. I think that our kids will do it if we ask them to do it. And we're not asking everyone to. We're just asking for the choice. So again, to the board, thank you for everything. I'm sure you all have had a very long five to six months um, talking about this and thinking about this, and we appreciate everything you're doing. But as a teacher, I just want everyone to know that Many of us are ready and willing to go back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Next, we have T. Pitts, but after T. Pitts, we have Dana Franson, Stephanie Tillman, and Valerie Abbott. But I think Valerie said that she did not, she wanted to retract her speaking time. Um, so we'll have T. Pitts, Dana Franson, and Stephanie T um, Tillman. T. Pitts, if you're there, you're more than welcome to share your comment. And I just have the first initial T in Pitts. If you're still on the line and would like to, sh to share any feedback. And if not, we will move on to the next person, Dana Franson. Hi, um, I don't even know where to start. I am speaking on Thursday. Um, I am a teacher at Hermitage High School. I teach 10th, 11th and 12th graders. My first concern is when, not if, but when I get COVID, who's gonna care for me? I live by myself. My parents are in their 70s. Who is gonna care for me? Who is gonna teach my AP students a sub? Good luck with that. Um, I honestly, like, I'm shaking right now because I the, the, the people who are not understanding, teachers don't have a choice. We are given the choice to go back 
and teach in person and virtual or to quit. I can't quit. I love my job also. I can't quit. Um, I want people to take this into account when we get this, okay? Our kids are going to suffer because we are not there to educate them. A substitute cannot teach my classes the way I can teach my classes. Um, no, we do not have a choice. Please read the research. We do not have a choice. And the, the, so many different things in that I have the most amazing collaborative partner I've ever had in my career. How are we going to do that? I have a teaching area that I'm not allowed to leave. Plus, if I'm teaching virtual and in person, I'm sitting at my desk anyway. I can't interact with the students in my room so that the kids on the camera can see me. That is not going to work. And that is our choice. That is the choice we are given. Um, also, what I should have said to begin with, thank you, Mrs. Kinsella, for responding to my email. Um, probably, and I'll talk about this on Thursday too, um, I think I've said most of my points, but um, I have been losing sleep. Every time we get close to this choice, I lose sleep, my anxiety over this because it is not, the in-person and virtual is not going to work. And we we really don't have a choice and I'm not gonna give up my job, a job that I worked hard for and earned three college degrees for so that I can, I don't know what I'm gonna do. This is my dream job. This is my career. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I love my kids more than anything. If you ask anybody in my building, if you need to volunteer for something, I volunteer for it. I coach, I sponsor, I do it all at that school. And I wanna continue to do that. And I wanna be healthy to do that. And the most important person in my life is my 72 year old father who was a cardiac patient and if we have to go back now i will not see him again i don't know for how long and that is the choice you all are asking me to make so those of you who are saying we have a choice i do not have a choice so please make the right decision i am giving everything i have to my kids and i will continue to give everything i have to my students online right now because that is what's safer and i have not lost a student ever but i've seen my parent my students lose their parents and that was hard enough i don't want to lose a student either and that is what we are facing with this so i'm begging you guys to please make the right decision and parents please i know you want your kids to be educated but you have to think about these things and we do not have a choice and i'm begging you to take us into consideration yeah thank you yeah Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Dana. Next, we have Stephanie Tillman. Stephanie, if you're there. Um, hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm Stephanie Tillman. I am the mother of um, a 10th grade 10th grader at Holland Springs High School and a seventh grader at Fairfield. And the first thing I would like to say is with all due respect to the um, physician assistant that spoke earlier, when you made the comment of only one child has died from COVID, to me that was very offensive because I have lost a child and one child death is too many. And for you to even, I don't know if that was your intention to make light of that, but that was really hurtful to me. Um, what I'm going to say is this, my seventh grader is struggling a little bit with online lear learning, my 10th grader is not. To me, I understand all of you that want a choice and that's great, we all deserve to have a choice, but you also need to understand for those of us that don't have a choice, I live with my 75 year old mother who is a heart patient and a diabetic. I am a nurse and first responder. I have seen this in the hospital on the front lines. I have seen someone go from having a minor cough to being intubated and almost dead in less than 24 hours. This is not a joke. Please don't make light of people's concerns regarding going back to school. If we have adults that can walk through a grocery store with their mask down below their nose and on their chin, treating it as a joke. How are their children going to behave when they get in a classroom and they're supposed to wear a mask all day long? You need to think about that, okay? If you want to send your children back, that is fine. 
But I'm saying for right now, with three weeks to go before the next nine weeks, do you seriously think that the teachers will be able to handle doing in-person and virtual with such little time in between planning? I understand you deserve a choice of whether to send your children back, but the teachers deserve a choice. Everyone deserves a choice. So all I'm saying is at least for the nine weeks that's coming, like the gentleman said before, we have Christmas and we have Thanksgiving that is gonna take a big chunk out of the nine weeks to come. And that will give you the time to plan so that when you go back in person, things will be a lot safer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment, Stephanie. Next, I had Valerie Abbott, but I believe Valerie shared that she did not want to um, share a comment. And so in the next group, we have Michael White, John Dickerson, and Harry Dell. So Michael White, if you're there, if you can unmute and share your comment. Uh, good evening. Thank you for uh, hearing my comments. First of all, um, I am a technology education teacher. I'm split between Tucko Middle School and Cuyacuson Middle School. And I want to thank the school board for the courage uh, and discipline to make the decision to go virtual the first nine weeks. I want to, I, I appreciate that. I know there was a lot of parental pushback. I would like to piggyback on what Jeff B said. And then that is this. <clears throat> um, there's, there needs to be some practical considerations of what's going to happen. There have been school systems throughout the country have gone back and meet to, uh, uh, in person immediately because of spikes uh, in COVID. They had to shut down and go back to virtual. We're going to have two um, super spreader events. We're going to have Thanksgiving holiday, and then we're going to have the winter break. Okay, so um, this is not going to be a contiguous nine weeks. It's going to be broken up as it is. We're likely to have a spike due to COVID, and, we, and it's also going to be during the flu season. So I think as a practical matter, has any serious consideration been given to the possibility that we start back up and immediately have to go back to uh, all virtual because, because of uh, health con considerations, okay? Um, and I think that's something we should be giving serious thought to before, because look at, look at all the um, disruptions already occurred. We've got... Um, roughly what 25% of the of the staff, the teachers, saying that they're not wanting to go back uh, to the building already. So if you go through all that, and then if you have to shut down, um, you know, I think we'd be better off if we waited till the th uh, third nine weeks. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Michael. I'll also share that it's 7 p.m. So we are one hour into our conversation and we have one more hour to go. Um, thank you all for doing your best to stick to that 90 second um, rule. I know it's hard, but thank you all for trying to. Um, we're hopeful to get through the rest of our speakers. And as it stands, we have about 25 more folks who are looking to speak. So if we can keep that in mind. Next, we have John Dickerson. John, if you will unmute your mic and share your comment. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, the, the time tonight. I'd like to say something about the teachers. We can't thank you enough. You are so valuable to our kids, uh, to the families, and you really shape our children. You're not paid enough, and we can't appreciate you enough. Uh, what I will also say is that I actually agree with every single person that's spoken tonight. And um, the great thing is, is there's one option that actually works for everybody, and that is having a choice. To the parents that have children uh, that don't want to go back, that have autoimmune issue, issues, that have older parents, you should not have to send your kids back and you should stay home and continue to learn virtually. To the teachers that aren't comfortable going back, that have issues that prevent them from going back, that may want to go back but they can't because they could get someone sick or themselves sick, they should not have to go back. All we're asking is for the opportunity to have the choice to go back. If you look at the data from the survey that you all just ran, there's a great uh, dynamic between the percent of teachers that want to go back and the percent of students that want to go back. We can make this work. 
Hanover's made it work. It's one out one mile from where I am standing. Chesterfield has made it work, and Goochland is making it work. We can make it work. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Next, we have Harry Dell, but after Harry, we have John Parkhurst, Jeff Bookbinder, and Roderick Miller. Harry Dell. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, I actually go by Chip Dell. I'm a teacher at Hermitage High School. I teach world history here. I'm actually in my classroom right now because um, I've been prepping for tomorrow and the rest of the week. Uh, so that's kind of the life that we're in right now. Um, I do want to thank the board uh, in particular. I was at the meeting um, in the summer when they chose to go for online um, for the first nine weeks. And I want to thank them for that decision. Um, within the first uh, five weeks of school, um, my classroom would have actually been exposed to COVID-19. Uh, we've had a case of a family member uh, of someone who actually passed, um, who is here. And of course, that's been a really hard thing. Um, um, I have another student who actually went to the hospital um, with COVID symptoms. Um, and we didn't hear from them for, they went on a Friday and we didn't hear from them for the rest of the week. Um, and, uh, well, for four days anyway. And it's, uh, it's really tough. Like those types of things take a toll on you and you are wondering what's happening next and where is this going to go? And, um, I don't know about anybody else, but I have a healthy fear for this, for this virus. And uh, teachers' anxiety levels have been through the roof with what's been going on. And my, my students have been reacting to it, too, and telling me about this. Um, I have uh, virtual, virtual school has been a challenge, um, but we're improving. Um, and attendance levels are good. Students are learning. Um, Students are reaching out. I've had students reach out to me and talk to me about other things that have happened in their lives that aren't COVID related, but are very serious. Uh, deaths in the family, stuff like that. And I had one student who called me late at night and told me, or not called me, texted me on remind late at night and uh, told me that her grandmother had died. And, and I was just thinking as I was talking to her through text messages, I was like, if I saw the student in the classroom and they told me this, how am I not going to reach out to that student and give them a hug? You know, teachers are, are caretakers too. Um, and to have to choose between my healthy fear for COVID and the humanity that I try to show my students is something that's like really, really tough. Um, so I really feel like um, we should stay online. And I believe that since things haven't been perfect, why not send out a survey to teachers and other people to find out what has been working and where we can improve in order to continue to make this a workable situation until we can go uh, return back to school safely? You know, let's not let's not go back to school in the middle of a third wave that's coming apparently across the country. Let's let's try and find out what we can do that will make things better until we can go back safely. That's where our next survey should be taking us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chip. Next, we have John Parkhurst. Uh, hi there. Good evening, everyone. This is actually Aaron Parkhurst. John is my son. I had to log in under his account, so apologies. Um, I'm glad to see so many teachers assembled here tonight and uh, to be able to hear from so many of you and and um, and to hear your thoughts and your concerns. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, John is my son. He is the youngest of my three. He is a senior at uh, Douglas Freeman High School. He spends 11 to 12 hours a day in front of a screen um, between AP classes, college applications, homework. It is a grind. Uh, and I'm sure that I don't need to say anything more about that. Any parents of high school seniors are going to understand that um, situation. I just wanted to say tonight that I feel very confident sending him back to school and uh, due to the same things that a number of other parents have, have said, so many other counties across the state and across the country are making hybrid learning work. My own sister is a middle school teacher in Collier County in Florida 
and they have multiple choices. They have a 100% virtual academy. They have students who are learning um, synchronously online and they have students in the classroom. And I have, two, I have a niece and a nephew and they are doing great. And my sister is very, very pleased with the outcome. We can do the same thing. Please, please give us all a choice. I agree with what the parents said a minute ago that the only, the only option that works for everyone is choice. One size does not fit all. Um, I just really appreciate hearing from some of the teachers who have expressed their willingness to go back to the classroom. I know there must be others out there. Um, at the same time, I respect uh, those of you who have needs and health situations and challenges that make it uh, difficult, uncomfortable, impossible uh, for you to go back to school. But let's set it up so that we don't all have to be, again, one size just doesn't fit all. I can't, I can't emphasize it enough. The last thing I'll say is that I, you know, again, I feel confident about going back because I've been reading the material that Henrico County Public Schools has been putting out for seven months. This isn't a rush back to school, folks. There is lots, there are lots of plans in place that make sense. They are thoughtful, they are careful, and I believe our students and the staff who elect to go back to school will be safe. So um, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Anne. Our next three commenters are Jeff Bookbinder, Roderick Miller, and I also saw T. Pitts in the comments. It looks like your mic is working, so we'll get you in after Roderick Miller. So Jeff Bookbinder, if you're still here. Uh, I am still here and I already spoke earlier. Um, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Roderick Miller. We've got Roderick Miller on the list. Okay, next we have T. Pitts. If you're out there. T. Pitts. Okay, so I guess again, we'll come back to you if you if your mic is working a little later. The next group, we have Sophia, no last name for Sophia, Kelly, we also did not have a last name for Kelly, and then Vivian Parker. So Sophia, if you signed on, uh, signed up earlier, you're more than welcome to leave your comment now. It's actually Tom, I, I, I'm terrible. Oh. But it's fine. <laughs> my, my comment is nine weeks ago, we made the decision to go virtual. The only thing that has changed since that decision is made is 485 more Virginians have died and the infectious rate has gone up. Why should we go back now? Makes no sense to me. These parents talking about how great Hanover is, they've had to close entire schools. They've had to close classes. They've had to disrupt their entire day just to go back. These parents who have pulled their kids out of Henrico County Schools and have put them in private schools. I work in a private school. You are lying to everyone and yourself when you say everything is going smoothly. They've had the same issues of classes having to, to pod out for two and a half weeks to having to close entire schools in the private sector. It's ridiculous. You guys can't wear masks. You guys can't even buy the proper masks to actually protect anyone because it makes you too hot. It's silly, it's ridiculous. If we couldn't go back nine weeks ago, why should we go back now? Going back to that nurse assistant who said that the teacher said 21 students would die, that is not what the teacher said. The teacher said 21 staff members would die. And I still feel like that's accurate. And Henrico County, who won't go to school for a dusting of snow in fear for a lawsuit, is willing to risk the lives of their teachers and staffs because a couple parents can't put their kids in daycare? It seems ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Kelly. Kelly, if you signed up to, to speak. Kelly, we don't have a last name for you, but if you, you're here and signed up. Okay, we'll move along. Vivian Parker. Mm -hmm. 
Vivian Parker, if you are here and signed Hello. up to speak. There you go. Hello. <laughs> So this is actually Crystal Parker. I've had a login as my daughter as there have been some issues connecting. Um, I wasn't intending to speak tonight, but as many parents who have spoken for a choice to reopen, I felt like it was important to speak as a parent for asking us to stay virtual. Um, First, I need to say to Marcy Shea and Christy Kinsella, thank you for being here tonight. You are giving up more time with your family to be here. So please, when this is done, go give your children a big hug. They deserve it. Um, a choice for parents is not a choice for teachers. Yes, 75% of parents have agreed. I mean, excuse me, 75% of teachers have said they're willing to come back, but over 50% have also asked for accommodations when it comes to coming back. So that's not three quarters of teachers asking to come back. Half of parents are split with it when it comes to staying virtual versus returning in person. But we also have to think about what are these numbers looking at, like on an individual school level. This is a logistical challenge to try and figure all of this out. Virtual learning may not be perfect, but I know of many children that are doing really well. I have a first grader and a preschooler in Henrico County programs that love virtual learning. I have a friend, an exceptional education child who is thriving more now in virtual learning than they ever did in the classroom. And so this might not be perfect, but we as parents get to set the tone and to make this as good as we can to advocate for our children and to make this the best that we can. Many of us may not be high risk, but bringing our kids back into the classroom who are just germ monsters, to be completely honest, We'll be bringing these germs to at risk family members of the teachers and our own families. And by coming back into the classroom, this puts our family members at risk. Family that I have not been able to see in over seven months that I will, I will no longer be able to see until this is better. And so please, please keep up virtual learning that may not be perfect, but it's going a whole lot better than anyone's giving credit for. And I have to tip my hat to my child's school that is doing an exceptional job and to our teachers that are rocking it. You are working harder than ever and I ask that you keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Vivian. Our next group, Katherine Perkins, Carla Ingram, and Leslie Cantor. So Katherine Perkins. Hi there, my name's Kathy. Thank you all for taking the time tonight. I, I really appreciate it. Um, what I want to say is I am a nurse, and as a nurse, knowing the medical consequences that this could have, um, especially as we go into the flu season, it's very scary. It is very scary. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was very sick and in the hospital for one month. I know what that did to my children. Um, it tore them apart. I know if they also went back to school and brought home, uh, well, actually I only have one in school, the other two have graduated, but if they brought home the virus, I think that would tear, really tear them apart and devastate them. My husband has, um, heart issues, so that puts him on a complication. My father died, which has been very difficult for them, and my mother has pulmonary hypertension. So getting a disease like that just isn't going to work. I mean, I know we want our children to have proper education, and that is so important, and socialization, but if they get this disease or if their mom or dad or grandparents pass away from it because they brought it home, I think it's going to affect them lifelong. I've been there, I know what it's like as to how my children were affected when I was in ICU dying. Um, and it wasn't from COVID. Um, so I just think it'll be very, very difficult. And I think we need to think about that. I think we need to think about our teachers because they're really putting themselves out there to be there for our children. So thank you for the time to talk. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kathy. Next, we have Carla Ingram. Good evening. Um, I, I had not, 
I had not intended to talk. Well, first, let me say thank you to Ms. Shea and um, Ms. Kinsella for speaking with us this evening. And thank you, Ms. Cole, for moderating. Um, I originally had intended to really just listen. Um, but I felt it really necessary as I heard people talking about um, the holidays coming up and how, you know, parents are feeling on both sides and how teachers are feeling on both sides. And I did even hear one student, um, which I thought was was very eloquent of him to, to get on and voice um, his concerns as well. Um, I wanted to speak for the children who are who are also very um, concerned and um, have anxiety about being in school under these circumstances. This is a very tough circumstance for our children as well. And I've been reading some of the comments about choices and about our kids having socialization and all of that. And our children are very resilient. Our children are, um, this is the technology, you know, I'm, I'm in technology and um, our children are more technology savvy and do more on the computer than we ever have. We telling them all the time, put your phone down, put your phones down, get out of that computer. So they're doing this all the time. Um, and so um, it, I, I really just feel like we've got to really take our time in moving back, um, back towards having people gather. I mean, I'm watching and reading all of the time that we're being asked now not to even have family gatherings for two of our biggest holidays of the year, Thanksgiving and Christmas. We are being asked as a nation not to gather with our families in order to stay safe. So my question is for us to be asked not to gather as families during the holidays, um, how, how to me, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of how it would be, how it would be okay for us to have our children and our teachers and our administrators back to gathering together in much larger quantities than even they're asking us to do for our family holidays. Um, it's, it's, it's just very concerning to me that I'm being asked by the CDC, by um, epidemiologists by all of these people not to gather for Thanksgiving, but two weeks before Thanksgiving, I could be being asked to have my son go back to school. Yeah. And um, those are those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carla. Next, we have Leslie Cantor, but after Leslie, we have Jessica and Carrie Hunter, followed by Mary Simmons and Ashley George. So Leslie Cantor. Uh, good evening. I'd like to thank the school board for having this town meeting and for all the people who are participating and for all of those who are advocating for um, virtual education to continue. My question to the um, school board and those listening is how many people will die if we continue with remote learning? Can we not really find ways to support uh, our kids with social emotional learning and engage them with their families with these things? It's, it's my view that no one should have to give up their life so that another can maximize their academic gains. We're asking for our safety for perhaps another nine weeks, for perhaps another 18 weeks, but for whatever it takes. This um, amount of time for remote learning and to continue it is really a small sacrifice for human life. And I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Next, we have Jessica and Carrie Hunter. Hey there, thank you so much for taking the time to do this tonight. Um, my name is Jessica. I am um, an educator in Eddy School in the Puckahoe District. Um, my school had a third of the families not respond to the survey. And of those families, I uh, crunched the data and almost half of them have a home language 
other than English. Almost half of them receive free and reduced lunch. A quarter of them are Hispanic and a quarter of them are black or mixed race. What measures were taken to ensure that the most marginalized families were able to access and complete that survey uh, that's driving this decision? Given that these groups are dispro disproportionately affected by the virus, I feel that it's imperative that we take their you up for a an episode. Thank you, so Thank you. Thank you. I was asking just Sadie if she was up for an episode. Just a I'm reminder to my... everyone on the call, if you can mute your phone, thank you. And thank you all so much for, we're flowing through pretty well, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get through. Um, we're almost to 7.30, so that means we're almost to 30 more minutes left um, in, our, in our dialogue. Next, we have Mary Simmons. Mary, if you're out there. Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm calling because I have two high schoolers at Holland Springs High School. I'm a mother of three. I have underlying health issues. I have congestive heart failure and I'm a diabetic type two. What we're actually facing is a pandemic, which is something that is actually dangerous, which we don't know how to recover from until the government finds a cure and to stabilize this pandemic, I do ask to keep my kids safe so they would not bring anything back to me. I also would like to give thumbs up to our teachers. They done a, they do a wonderful job. I thank them for all their skill sets that they have. I wish not to put them in danger or to endanger their family members. We need to be considerate of what the actuality is. Um, yes, some things we do want to, I do would like to send my kids back, but we're not stabilized. Sometimes these things takes at least a year to clear out. You have to look at malaria and other things that have happened in the past. So sometimes it take a week out for us to understand what we're actually facing. I'm just asking you to just consider, look at the odds, Look at the reality when we actually dealing with people lives. The children are our future. And so if we sit here and send our kids out there and they bring it back, it's a super spreader. And I just think we just need to look and evaluate things. We have to really actually understand school may be out for the full year. I'm still not comfortable if we were to go back, I would not be comfortable in sending my kids to school. And I will stand the right of not sending them back and face whatever I need to face because I will not send them back until we have a cure, until this thing is actually tackled. So I want to thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much, Mary. Next, we have Ashley George, but after Ashley, we'll have Sean Wilkinson, Kim Spencery, and Hattie Crawley. So Ashley George. Okay, um, my thoughts are kind of all over the place, but that's me. Um, I have a son at Cuyacusan and I have two children at Pemberton. And um, my first thought is the survey that was sent to the staff might not actually be quite accurate because I do know that it went directly to these um, supervisors. So maybe the employees didn't want to indicate that they weren't willing to come back or didn't, you know, didn't feel comfortable because if it was going directly to your supervisor, you might really not want to state something like that. Um, just an opinion. Also, um, when it comes to the problems that everybody's describing about tech issues, there's still a lot of problems that occur in a classroom that break up the learning day all the time. And I worked for Henrico County for several years, so I know I've been in the classroom. So the tech issues I kind of consider maybe a disruptive child or somebody being, being sick or somebody needing a pencil or something like that. So that they still occur in a classroom. So that's what I think of. Um, another thought is I have no idea how to tell between a a sniffle, a sneeze, um, anything with cold and flu 
it freaks me out. I mean, every time anything happens with my children right now, I don't know, do they have COVID? Do they have allergies? What is it? And I would never send my children to school because I'd be scared to death that they would have something and I would never know. And any mom knows that children don't spike a fever until late in the afternoon unless they're already sick. So they would spend the day at school and then they'd come home and then they'd have a fever. That normally is what happens. And then um, my other thought is with siblings, how would you know? I mean, if my daughter, somebody in her class was sick, how, I mean, are you gonna quarantine that classroom? And then I have a daughter in another classroom. I mean, what's gonna go along with that? Are both my children home? Uh, you know, it's just kind of confusing. I don't know how you would handle that really. Um, and then as for active, my children are extremely active right now because they're not sitting in the same place. They're up, they're moving. The teachers do an amazing job right now of making them move. If they were sitting in a classroom, they'd be stuck in one spot, not moving, not talking. I mean, my kids are all over the place. And socializing, there's children riding bikes all through the neighborhoods right now, if you look outside. That's what everybody comments about. And I really just don't want my children to have another disruption in their learning. They lost in March. Now, if it, if it changes over again, we're gonna restart. So that means if you go back November, it's gonna be like the first day of school all over again. And everybody's gonna to have to relearn everything. If you're gonna switch, wait and do it after they're used to a long break. And I think that's all other than thank you all very much for everything that you do. And we appreciate you. Thank you so much, so much, Ashley. Sure. Audience, it's now 7.32. We have about 28 minutes left. Um, we are, we have a pretty solid list left. And so we're not accepting any more um, signups. We just likely wouldn't get through them, um, but we will do our best to get through. Again, I'll remind um, speakers, if you can do your best to stay at um, 90 seconds if possible, and I know that's a lot to ask, but we really want to hear as many voices as possible. Next, we have Sean Wilkinson. Um, first of all, I'd like to you know, thank the school board and thank everyone for doing a part in this virtual um, town hall meeting. I think it gives a great way for every parent and teacher to speak their view. And one thing that I've continuously heard is that giving choice. And I think in our environment today, giving choices is so important. No matter if you have a choice to go into a grocery store or a choice not to, if you have a choice to go to your job or stay at home, visit a family member, that with the school system operating, a lot of the school systems that are going back at the present moment, those parents have a choice to send their kids back or to not do it. I have twin girls that are in first grade at Tucker Elementary. Tucker Elementary has done a fantastic job on getting the program enrolled to all students as best as they could. But being as a first grade parent and seeing your kids learn at a virtual level, it's very tough for an elementary student to actually learn as it is in a virtual environment, let's say as a middle school or a high school student. My ask is a lot of school systems around the state, especially around Henrico County, have chosen to actually send the elementary kids back in a phased in process first versus sending everyone back. And one thing I didn't see on the survey was having that phased in approach actually taken place in Henrico where you know, K through three could go back in a phased in process first and have the school board to consider that as well. Thank you so much. Next, we have Kim Spencery. Hi, um, I'm a teacher at Godwin High School and I wanna thank everybody and I'm not gonna take too much time elaborating on that, but just know that I thank you all. All right, let's first of all talk about choice. As we all talk about choice, let's understand that if we could have a perfect world, we could all get our choice. But we're dealing with many things. And one of the things we're dealing with is money. And so therefore, it is not possible to have teachers just stay out if they choose to without and, and having so that other students can choose to learn and then hire more teachers to teach them. 
That requires a budget that I doubt very seriously Enrico has. So therefore, choice is really not an option all around. I also want to draw put put some um, focus on some of the facts. Um, 20 to 80 percent of shedding of the virus occurs for elementary school children at the same rate as it does for adults. In high school students, high school students shed the virus at the same rate as an adult does. The difference is, is that they don't exhibit symptoms or they don't come down with the virus at the same rate as adults seem to. So when we look around the country and we want to know whether or not schools are actually super spreaders, we have to look at what the epidemiologists say. Right now, there's a study out of Purdue University that suggests that schools are not super spreaders or not determined as super spreaders because there's no data to support that. That's right. There's no data to support that because there is no data. Public schools are not testing. If public, unlike the universities, which have proven testing as essential, public schools are not testing and therefore the only data we have is that data which is self-reported. We have many people perhaps going around that are asymptomatic, taking it out into their community, taking it into their homes. We talked today, my colleagues have spoken about statistics of, of those that have suffered and died. It doesn't take more than one to make it a tragedy. It doesn't take more than one if that one is you to make it a loss that cannot be recovered. Our, so, our society has been very gifted. We have been gifted in the fact that we have not had a crisis in my lifetime, and I'm 65. A crisis of this kind. But the world has experienced these crises before, and they've been asked to make choices, not based on what they needed, not based on what was important for them personally, but what was important for the whole. I think perhaps this is a time in our society when we are being asked to make choices based on what is right for the whole. And as much as there are families and kids that want the choice to go back to school, let's understand that the risk does not, that the, I'm sorry, that the benefits do not outweigh the risk because the benefits are very nil. School will not be, as my colleagues have said before, what it was as you imagined. There, it is going to be online learning because especially in the middle school and high school situation, you are apt to be able to go virtual at any given time. Your curriculum will look exactly the same. You will be on a, online, you will be at a computer the whole day. You'll just be on that in a classroom. But let's also, let me quickly just address another point. You said everything is fine, they'll just wear masks, we'll just be careful. Sitting in a classroom with masks off for a half an hour, talking and sharing among high school students and middle school students in rooms with no cross ventilation is a risk comparable to any high risk they talk about where they don't have COVID protocol. And so therefore I'm saying to you that while your choices are understandable, they don't deserve to negate somebody else's rights to remain healthy. And by the way, one more thing, the kids that are going to remain virtual, it is not fair to them in their choice to remain virtual in a hybrid situation because it will be harder for them to learn with teachers that are wearing masks and perhaps face shields on top of masks and diverting their attention between their screen and their classroom. And for those of you who can't what will empathize with that, thank you. But if you haven't done it, you can't even imagine how hard it is trying to keep track of who's on a screen. Most of us have two monitors, at least, along with their computer, just to keep track of everything that's going on. So those kids that are on virtual, that are at home, their ability to learn is going to be seriously deteriorated because of the choices that others need to make to be in school, still on computer, but just in a different setting. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Kim. Next we'll go, Hattie, I saw you in the comments. You did not want to um, leave a comment, so I did get your note. Next we have Kenny Wirtz. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. 
How you doing? Um, I'm not an educator. I uh, I have two students at uh, Longdale, a fourth grader, a kindergarten, a kindergartner. I um, also I'm a school resource officer at uh, one of these neighboring counties. So and I'm in a high school. So uh, my comment is not comparative. I don't want to say one county is doing something better than the other. Mine's more of a suggestion because we hear a lot about the. It sounds like the safety aspect is the concern. And uh, someone said earlier that, you know, there aren't uh, enough uh, nurses in all the schools um, and and how, you know, and then having to teach in the classroom and on and online at the same time, which be problematic. Uh, educators, you guys do a great job every day. My kids are obviously online and uh, my fourth grader wants to go back. Uh, my kindergartner, she loves it. She's having a great time. Um, but I would I would caution that because with the teacher's workload and it and the students able and the students being able to comprehend information, I'm wondering has Henrico even considered doing a whole separate online school? That way the curriculums they can marry each other, they can move at the same pace, but you have your own set of teachers, principals, um, admin uh, for online um, as they do in in, um, in person. Um, that way the the students, when if there's parents that don't want to go back for whatever reason, because I have um, people that look like me are at higher risk for contracting COVID. Um, but in the same breath, I have talked to uh, students now at the high school I'm at who have come back from virtual and say, hey, I'm having a hard time. I'm glad to be back because now I can grasp it a little bit more in person. Um, I think I think rushing back this second nine weeks might be a little premature. I believe um, I, I think that you all should look at it a little bit, uh, a little bit better, uh, a little more in depth about the health. Um, there's because there's risk in everything. Let's just be real. Mm-hmm. You can you can stay home all day and you go out one time, you can catch it. So there's risk in everything. I'm not downplaying that at all, but um, I think the option for both should be presented there, and but it should be presented in the safest way possible. And from what I've seen, an online entity as well as an in-person entity has worked pretty well. Nothing's perfect, but from what I've seen day to day and interacting with the kids and everything, uh, I think that'd be your best bet. Okay. Thank you so much, Kenny. Lillian Watkins. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name is Lillian, and I'm from Hungry Creek. I'm a student there. And I want to go back to school or have the choice to go back to school because we don't have like the opportunity to do stuff like they're just now opening clubs or starting to think about open clubs in the school. And like we should have been doing that in virtual school, but that I just wanted to think that we should go back to school. Thank you so much, Lillian. Next, we have Erica Wood, but after Erica, if Lauren Knitter, Audra Vanderland, and Emmy Croxford can be prepared. Erica Wood? Um, so I just want to just piggybacking off of a lot of what was said. One of the things I want to say is um, while I do uh, listen to my children and I take their consideration, I take what they think into consideration, I am a reasonable adult. so. I know my 12 year old would probably play Roblox all day if he could and eat junk food, but because I am a reasonable adult and I understand the effect that has on his body, I make choices that are better for him because I know better. And so um, while everyone is conceding that um, the other counties have done it better, Virginia was trending downward and now we're trending upward. And the only thing that I can see that we are doing differently is the schools are open. So just keep that in mind. But my comment is more so for teachers, administrators, um, family members of teachers or administrators, um, parents who are concerned. The deal has already been made. I am listening to you guys. The jobs have been posted. The, the school board, Dr. Cashwell, they have already made up their mind. So my suggestion to the suggestion to the teachers, administrators, family members, and um, parents, mobilize. And if you feel like your board member is sitting here pretending to listen, they are pretending that they heard you, vote them out. That is the power that you have going into the next the next time the election comes up, vote them out. Because 
I don't like my time being wasted. And I feel like this is a waste of time. I feel like the teachers are put in a corner that they should not be put in. When I received the survey as a parent, I felt like I was put into a corner. My child has an IEP. And so I definitely, and I have much respect for my teachers and I see the work that they're doing. But like I said, if you guys don't feel like you are being hurt, it is hurting my heart. My parent, my grandparents were teachers. You have the power, just mobilize and vote them out. And so that's my suggestion to you. Thank you, Erica. Next, we have Lauren Knitter. Hi, um, I'm a senior at Freeman High School. So of course I want to go back because it's my senior year and I really miss all my teachers and my friends. But I understand with going back, I'm not the one who's at risk. With going back, I've spent 13 years in school learning what it means to be a good citizen. And at this point in time, being a good citizen means mitigating community spread, which would be the exact opposite of what we were doing if we went back. Um, and for me personally, virtual learning is going surprisingly well. I was so against it at the beginning, but I just, I can't believe how well it's going. And I know I'm really lucky that I'm able to learn through virtual learning. And I know it's so much harder for other people, but my teachers have done an amazing job of making it work. Um, that being said, I was wondering if it had been considered to only have some classes go back in person, such as like lab sciences, special ed, younger elementary school grades and music classes, because all my classes are really able to adapt to the virtual format, except for my music classes and kind of my lab sciences in particular. Um, and that's really difficult. But other than that, I just I don't understand why we would take the risk of going back or offering a choice when a choice for students really isn't a choice for teachers. Thank you so much, Lauren. Next, we have Audra Vanderland. Audra Vanderland. Hi, sorry about that. I'm actually her husband, Dan Smith. Um, okay. So I edited some of my, my comments um, like, from what I wanted to say, because um, a lot of people have hit the points that I've been really hurt. Uh, to my heart of the whole situation. Um, I, I'm a dad of Henrico students. Uh, my wife is a teacher. Um, she's currently lesson planning right now. Um, uh, right now. Um, so it's been really upsetting to me when I hear the word choice and things like that because she's not going to get that choice. Um, when I hear like choice of face to face and going back, it's that we're in this really unworldly situation that it's an, it's an actual natural disaster that's occurring all around us. And we are trying to, we, we don't have a choice to return to a building that's on fire. Um, like we rely on the professionals to let us know when it's safe to go inside again. And we can't really have any wiggle room around that or else people will get hurt. And if kids are going in, the numbers are going to rise. And we know that this virus is, doesn't just hurt in the immediate. It doesn't just kill. It could ruin so many organ systems. It could have such a lifelong debil debilitating effect. Um, my wife, she's at 7, 7.50 right now, and she's still doing lesson planning um, that she knows she can't go back. And she can't do it for herself. She can't do it for her daughter who has, me who has complex medical issues. And we know that the best way to, for the move, move forward is just to think of the whole system and the whole picture, that what's the best way to move forward and what's the safest way to move forward for the whole community. Um, uh, thank you so much and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Vanderlyn. Next, we have Emmy Croxford. Hi, um, I have three students. Uh, two are at Ruby Carver and uh, one is at the Highland Springs ACA Center. Um, two of my children are in the exceptional ed program. So that is what some families or some folks I've heard are calling special needs. I have two kids on IEPs. Some, some stuff is 
uh, a lot and some stuff is minor. Um, I'm also a single mother. So the whole, the whole uh, of what I am is pretty much what I hear people talking about when they're talking about people uh, who don't have as much equity as another family. Um, my main concern is not necessarily uh, that, but my kids have worked really hard to forge relationships with their teachers and their teachers have done a fantastic job. Their administrators have done a fantastic job of reaching out and making sure my students who have a hard time forging those relationships regardless are making those relationships. So my concern is, are they going to have the same teacher whether they stay at home or go in? If my teacher goes in, then does my virtual student lose their teacher? Or if they stay at home, does the teacher that goes in, do I, um, so hopefully that's clear. Like I really want those relationships to stay put because they really are doing such a fantastic job. For people who are worrying about IEP students, my particular students are getting tons of small group work they're actually getting more one-on-one -on -one time than they would be in the in a classroom setting. They're not being pulled out of recess. They're not being done. They're not in a situation where they're made to feel uncomfortable. Their reading group is staggered in such a way that it goes when the other kids go for reading. They are really thriving. My child, who was not even reading anywhere near close to grade level, has jumped a whole grade level since school started because of that one-on-one -on -one or small group attention. So it kind of frustrates me when we're throwing it back at the, 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 the county that they are not making those efforts because I can tell you 100% that they are. Um, and in terms of, you know, being a special, uh, being a single mom, which is special, of course, but um, in terms of being a single mom and not having the same resources that another family might have, I can tell you in, in both schools, and clearly they are at separate parts of the county, so it has nothing to do with anything. They are completely separate parts of the county. The administration in both scenarios has reached out to me and asked me if there's anything that I need. So from, um, obviously we're all doing the, or not all, but some of us are doing the, the lunches that the county is providing and the breakfast. So that's obviously a help for a lot of us. But um, from hotspots to supplies, counselors are actually in your students' classes. I don't know if you know that. I sit eight feet or nine feet away from my, from my younger student. Their guidance counselors are going to their classes. They are participating in their classes and asking how they can help, how they can reach out. If you don't know that that resource is there, check your Clever board because it's actually in Clever that you can put a, a reach out to your student's guidance counselor. So that resource is available to them. Um, one thing I'm afraid of is that should we go back, the people that need the resources that the community has, put it, has already put in place, so like the help for moms and dads who have to work and that's the only other resource, those things will go away. And then if the classroom shuts down, there's no more resource. There's nobody to watch their children, it's gone. So if a, if a classroom has to shut down for 14 days or whatever, what are some moms and dads supposed to do with their children? I mean, we're, we're asking for something that's impossible. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emmy. It's 754. We have six minutes and we have about eight more people on the list and we really want to get through everyone who signed up. So I'm just going to read the names that are left and if commenters can be prepared to quickly share and then we'll have a closing from our school board members. So um, in order, we'll have Amber, Catherine McMahon, Kathy Sadal, Eileen Godden, Carla Mayers, Emily Tate, Patricia Adams and Valerie Abbott. So we will start with Amber. I did not have your last name, but Amber, if you're still here with us. Hi, I'm Amber. I'm a student from Shady Grove. I'm in third grade. I think we should go back to school because in virtual school, we often have technical 
difficulties with um, our internet and we usually get kicked out of the meeting and it's hard to unmute. And if we do go back to school, our teachers can actually help us if we are working on a computer and actually teach us real things. And we know we will go over obstacles, like a students will think a masks are very uncomfortable, but we're um, Shady Grove Cardinals, so we can go over these obstacles. I agree with my mom that she thinks the coronavirus has not been better, but students deserve to meet each other and communicate. So I think we can go back to school. Wow, thank you for your comments, Amber. Next, we have Katherine McMahon. Hi, my name is Katie McMahon. Um, I'm a social studies teacher at Hermitage High School. Currently, I teach, can y'all hear me? I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, cool. We can hear um, you. It's unmuting, so I wasn't sure. Um, and I currently teach psychology and US history. Um, and let me first say that I have been utterly humbled by many of my colleagues today, by many of the, the very supportive parents. And I just, I feel like we're looking at the situation with rose colored eyes, okay? You, I'm about to burst your bubble. I'm sorry, as our students would call it, this is about to be a vibe check. There is not gonna be a whole lot gained by going back in person. And I would also like to emphasize, while you're calling for choice, you're also limiting the choice of the people whom you are trusting to educate your children. And trust me, no one loves your kids more than we do. No one loves this job more than we do. But there is too many moving parts to make this feasible, particularly at the secondary level, okay? It's just not gonna work. And I'm thrilled that y'all have confidence in your kids' abilities to keep on masks. I really am, but I also get told um, several inappropriately worded phrases when I ask my kids to pull up their pants. So I don't have a whole lot of faith in the whole mask argument. Um, that having been said, I also don't have a choice. I'm a type one diabetic. I have been since I was 17, therefore I'm immunocompromised. It will be highly dangerous for me to return. I also will have to return as I am the only on-level psychology teacher for my school. It's not a choice. We're asking you to take our safety into consideration as well as your students. This is a big deal. I know you don't think it is, but I promise you, this is the active threat. And I just wanted to make sure that was put out there. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Kathy Sadal. Okay, go ahead. I am. Um, go ahead. It's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, I'm her daughter. My name is Miriam Kulbali and I'm in fifth grade. Um, as much as I would love to go back to school, um, I always think about the risks for my family, knowing that if my mom gets it, um, it could cause a whole thing. She's in a higher risk. And when I think about the teachers and how they don't really have a choice, we have to put them in mind instead of um, ev everyone else. And I, I, I agree that I agree that virtual learning is like the biggest pain, but we also we also have to stay safe until until this is over and until it simmers down, we should have the we should until it simmers down. I, I feel like we should continue virtual learning in our progress that we've done so far. And until then, we could we have a possibility to go back to school. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Next, we have Eileen Godden. So it's really hard to follow Miriam because she was very well spoken. Thank you, Miriam. So I actually probably would not have commented, um, but then the teacher survey came out. I'm a teacher at Shady Grove. And I absolutely adore my school, adore my students. Um, but it was very, very disheartening to see that the choices were retire, go back in person, resign, or take FMLA. So probably most people didn't know that I'm already on FMLA because I have a very medically fragile child, which I don't take advantage of the FMLA only when absolutely necessary. 
but going back in person will definitely be huge for that situation. Um, I also have children in Henry, um, Hanover County and comparing Hanover County situation to Henrico County is really apples and oranges because they have a whole separate school and right now it is working because they have 40% of their, their children in school. So they have the opportunity to be well over six feet away. And even with that, they've had a lot of outbreaks with COVID. I don't think people realize that school is gonna be very different. And I absolutely, I mean, I will tell you right up front that virtual school is not ideal. And it's been a huge learning, learning curve and I've spent, I don't even know how many hours a day trying to prepare for the next day, but it's working. I don't know, I mean, how well it's working, but it's definitely working and I absolutely adore my students. So I can't imagine them having to transition and having a different teacher or, it, I can't imagine being able to provide for them as well as in person, it, it's just, it's not gonna work. And I think the bottom line is, I mean, you can have parents, you can have teachers, you can have school board people, but the pandemic is pretty much dictating what's gonna happen. Within two months, there's supposed to be medically 140,000 more people dead in the United States of America. And I know, I'm not sure who said it initially, but there was only one person that died. I really don't want to know that there's one person that died in my classroom, in my family, in your family, in anyone's family. Yes. Um, so, you know, again, virtual is not ideal for anybody. As a teacher, I would love to be able to sing and dance. And quite frankly, I'm not sure how that's gonna work if they came back to school because that proximity would not be there. So thank you for your time. Yeah. Please consider, and again, one person is too many. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Eileen. Carla Mayers. Carla thank Mayers. Oh, uh, you thank go. you all for letting me speak. Um, I had not planned on speaking earlier either. I have a list, so I'm gonna go as quickly as I can, so bear with me. But um, I'm a teacher and I'm also a parent, but one of the things that I want to highlight, and it's for whomever is giving ear, but I feel like um, people are esteeming the teachers a little too highly. We are people. We did not choose this pandemic. We did not choose this situation. We are all in this together. And the primary function of a teacher, I believe, is to deliver instruction and to provide resources, make resources available for the students. And so there's a huge difference between idealism and realism. We all have this picture in our mind of what is going to happen in the classroom. But honestly, I have to agree with Ms. McMahon in reality it may not be exactly as you all, some of you are envisioning it, but your child's academic success is not totally predicated upon what is going on in that classroom. There are things that can be done in the home to help supplement this. We're only asking um, for support in the midst of this pandemic that you all work with the teachers, parents, teachers, and students work together. Um, social, emotional learning, um, school is not the only platform for that. If you really feel like your child is missing the essence of social and emotional support, then there are things that you can do in your backyard. You can connect with other parents in the community because the school right now, we just cannot, um, there are too many moving parts, as Ms. McMahon stated earlier in the building, that a lot of people, when they say they want their kids to return to school, for some of the very primary reasons that you want your child to return and some of the things that we are gonna have to change when they do come in the building. Um, mm -hmm. I commend my daughter's elementary school teacher. She's doing a fantastic job. My nine-year-old is thriving in virtual learning. And, but there's also something that is required of me as her parent. Because again, we're in the midst of this pandemic. And even if she is face-to-face, -face, 
she, there are things that she's not going to be able to do for my daughter that I can do at home. Because in your home, you do have full authority. You have the authority to make sure that your child is, number one, signed on, participating. Um, virtual learning can work, but it will require something from the parent, the teacher, and the student. Absolutely. Teachers, we're, we're not God. We are going to give you everything we can and give you everything we have and try to make it as best as we can, but we are also human. And there's a lot of anxiety that is being um, provoked from just returning in the building because we're all concerned about our safety and the safety of our family. Uh, my own father has stage four cancer and he's a chemo uh, therapy patient. And if I go in that building, I can't see him anymore either. But one of the things I want you all to keep in mind is that, um, I guess I'm at my limit, but let me make sure I yeah. <laughs> my points. Um, and yeah, we're this we've got about three sorry. more people and we want to give the school board members a moment to um to give their closing comments. Um but Carla, thank you. Thank you. I think you you've shared some really significant points. So thank you for for that. Um we've got three more. Um Emily Tate, if you're still on the call. Yes, hi, um, I'm Emily Tate and I am an elementary school counselor in the county and I also have uh, five-year-old twins who just started kindergarten. So this was not the way I envisioned their kindergarten year, but I have to say that, um, you know, I would rather be safe than sorry. Um, and I guess I'm coming from it from a school counseling lens in terms of what we want to teach our children and the lessons that we want to teach our children when we're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic um, and how we can all work together to end the pandemic. And we all know the way to do that is to minimize contact with a lot of people, you know, be careful, wear your masks, all that kind of stuff. But the safest way to do that, the most, the biggest way to do that is to just kind of stay put um, and it's not to bring, you know, 500 or 250 kids into a building with a lot of teachers who are immunocompromised and taking things back to their family. I think, you know, we need to look at what we're teaching our kids and our, what we need to teach our kids is that we need to take care of everybody and we all need to do our part to make this virus go away so that we all can get back to normal. But rushing into things and doing things kind of, I'm not saying you guys are rushing in because I know people do want to get back to school. We all want to get back to school. Um, but we are in a pandemic and what we need to show our kids is that we can be resilient. We can do the best we can with, with Microsoft Teams. Um, you know, we can make the best of a situation, but we all are going to hunker down and do what we need to do so that everybody can stay safe. Um, and I think that's a really valuable lesson to teach our kids. Thank you so much, Emily. Next, we have Patricia Adams. Good evening. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, my name is Patricia Adams. I'm an economics and personal finance teacher at Glen Allen High School. Uh, like many of you, I did not plan on speaking tonight, but I have a rather unique situation and I feel like I need to speak out on behalf of people like me. Uh, my husband is a cancer patient and has other comorbidities. Uh, we are empty nesters. Our youngest moved away during the summer. And when I received the survey for teachers, I really thought that there should have been an option that said, I am a caregiver for a high needs individual, and therefore I will be requesting accommodations. That was not there. Uh, there was one for me to say that I have a medical condition. Uh, it's not me. But bottom line, when I read the list of options, I have no choice. None. No choice. I am given no choice. I cannot risk his health uh, to come in and do this. That said, I am perfectly capable of teaching from home and uh, taking care of my students and giving them the information that they need to make them financially literate, productive citizens as we move forward. And I know lots of people in this same situation. Um, so bottom line, my choice is only uh, take leave, family medical leave, and then unpaid leave and see where it goes. And that is not what I want. So, um, the choices may not be as obvious as you thought, and I feel like that was an, a gross over. 
step to not include an option like that, because I don't know anyone who would be indecent enough to take advantage of a situation like that. And then there's a tenant in economics that says that the consequences of your actions often lie in the future. And I just ask you to consider what price is too high of a price, because the consequences of your actions will definitely lie in the future and they may not be immediate, but I'm afraid that they will be very, very costly. So thank you for your time. Good night. Thank you so much for your comments. Last but certainly not least, we have Valerie Abbott. Valerie, if you're still with us, your comment. Yes, I am. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. And thank you for um, including me towards the end. Um, I just wanted to mention my daughter is here with me. She goes to Freeman High School. And um, what some a statistic I want everyone to keep in mind is that the CDC reports that 15% of school aged children between the ages of six and 19 are either deaf or hard of hearing. And so returning to the classroom with masks is really not a good scenario for children or students with hearing loss. I am a huge supporter of masks. I am a huge supporter of masks everywhere we go. But when it comes to learning, that is going to be a giant barrier for her and for students like her. So if there is an option, um, I certainly hope that in the next nine weeks that it includes teaching without facial coverings because that makes it very difficult for students who are deaf and hard of hearing to understand, to acquire correct information from their teachers and from the students around them. And it's a large population. It's 15% nationwide and Henrico County is no different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who has shared comments. I love to have um, Marcy Shea and Christy Kinsella to just give brief comments as we wrap up our evening. And we'll start with we'll start with Marcy Shea. Thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you to each of you. Almost 300 that are on the teams and some more on Facebook and live stream that have joined us this evening. Um, Ms. Kinsella and I have been here to listen um, and it has been um, very informative for us. I also um, appreciate that every, all of our stakeholders got to hear opinions and point of views from other stakeholders in the county. Um, the board members and I see a lot, a lot of this information and these opinions in our inbox, but I think it's important just as we teach our students and our own children to be able to listen to differing opinions and, and consider those for us as a community to be doing that as well. If you saw me looking down a lot, I, was, I wasn't texting. Uh, I was furiously scribbling notes of all of our speakers, and so I really, uh, um, I really appreciate, um, again, your input. And um, thank you again. Kudos to our staff that are behind the scenes making this run smoothly. Um, Ms. Kinsella. Thank you, Mrs. Shea. And thank you to everyone who attended, whether it was Facebook Live, live stream, or right here on Teams with us. We greatly appreciate it. Um, this listening event, I think, as Mrs. Shea said, was valuable for everyone, um, all different kinds of perspectives. I've appreciated the chat here in Teams. I appreciated, I believe, I counted 56 speakers who actually gave comment and I wrote them all down. Um, and I plan to reflect on those uh, with all the other information that we will be reflecting on prior to making our decision on Thursday. Uh, once we receive the health recommendation and uh, other information in our presentations at the meeting. So just thank you to everyone. Um, we greatly appreciate the opportunity uh, tonight. So thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you all. This concludes our listening town hall. Um, I just want to say how much I appreciated the thoughts, the transparency, the diverse perspectives that we were able to, to have. And thank you to our school board for being open to really listening and hearing the comments from our Henrico family. I hope you all have a great evening and I hope that everyone is able to um, reconnect at the school board meeting this Thursday as well. Have a great night.